back here uh, to um, to live in the area as well as to uh, study uh, these beloved uh, endangered fishes of mine. And so today uh, we're going to talk about the fishes of the Old Sobel Channel and its vicinity, uh, the fish species at risk, the threats to those species, um, some solutions as, as they relate to the research that we're working on, and then Jennifer and Jessica will be introducing you to their research, and they'll be out in the field this summer uh, conducting that research. And then we'll, we'll fall, end up with a, a little request um, that we're looking for citizen scientists to help us out. So uh, to begin with, let's put the Old Sable Channel into the Canadian context. So this is the, this, the, the species richness by watershed across Canada of freshwater fishes. Uh, there's, there's about 215 species of uh, freshwater fishes in Canada. The most species rich watersheds are in southwestern Ontario, uh, where some watersheds have uh, as many as 100 or so species. And if we look a little closer, you can see that Grand Bend uh, is right about around here. The Old Sable Channel is right here. And um, we're, uh, it's one of the, the, the Sable drainage is one of the most species rich, fish species rich uh, watersheds in Canada. Uh, and then even, even more interestingly, you know, we, we have about a quarter of our species are at risk uh, of those 215. And uh, a, a lot of them are quite at risk in southwestern Ontario uh, because of the, the, the various land, land use um, uses uh, in the area. And if we look at the Grand Bend area, we see that, you know, there's five to seven uh, fish species at risk in the area. In, in fact, I think that's, uh, I believe the number is actually six. And that's not, you know, that in itself doesn't make um, uh, the Old Sable Channel in the area Canada's freshwater arc, but it's it's well on its way to, to um, uh, developing the case for such. And I'll point out that I'm only talking about fishes today, but I'm sure many of you know that this is also a hot spot for turtle species uh, and uh, uh, freshwater mussels and uh, semi-aquatic species like uh, amphibians. And the Old Sable Channel is, is very, you know, is, is, uh, is, uh, is unique in terms of why so many species persist in the area and in fact, there's over 60 species of, of fishes that have been recorded in the Old Sable Channel itself. Um, and in order to understand why it is uh, so unique, we need to think about the history. And I'm sure many of the locals are familiar with this history, but this is what the Old Sable Channel, uh, the, old, the, the Sable River looked like over 100 years ago. You, here's Exeter, it, it flowed down through Alicia Craig, down towards Arcona, but rather going out to Port Franks, it actually bent back northward and followed um, uh, up towards Grand Bend. And, and originally, uh, apparently it actually uh, drained at Grand Bend until the, the mouth of the, the river became so um, clogged that it actually reversed and traveled back between dunes along what is now, we now know to be the Old Sable Channel and then drained into Port Franks. Uh, so Grand Bend is named after the Grand Bend in the river. And I should point out there's an excellent website that really discusses the, the um, history of the area in detail, this oldestablechannel.ca. It's just a fantastic website that really talks about this. Well, you may recognize that uh, the Osable River no longer looks like this. And what we have instead is uh, about 100 years ago to uh, lessen flooding, uh, they created a cut. So rather than having the Osable River, this, this is the, dry, the now gone riverbed here in green, um, going through and up towards Grand Bend and back down through the Old Osable Channel and then 
uh, into the Lake Huron, there was this cut. And that cut um, cu basically cut off the old Salvo Channel from the watershed. And, you know, normally that's a bad thing. We, we want systems to be connected to the watershed, except that given the highly agricultural land use in the watershed, um, there was a lot of siltation and runoff. And, and that's exemplified in this relatively recent picture from uh, here's the Osable River uh, in the vicinity of the cut, and this is the old Osable Channel. Look at that stark difference in the color of the water. So you have this, you know, muddy brown water coming through out of the Osable River watershed through the cut, and it's muddy brown because of the 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 erosion and siltation uh, and runoff from agricultural fields. Whereas the old Osable Channel, uh, now that it's cut off, is not being fed by the watershed, but is actually being fed by groundwater, uh, largely groundwater seeping up from the sandy uh, dunes in the old Osable Channel itself. And one other thing I want to point out is towards the mouth of the old Osable Channel, there's an actual dam that actually prevents, for example, invasive species from moving up into the old Osable Channel, invasive species like uh, round, round goby, for example. So what we have here is we have an isolated um, waterway, the old Osable Channel, that is, is basically spring-fed from, from the sands, and hence the water is crystal clear. And it's this type of water that is required for some of the rarest fishes in Canada uh, that I will be talking about in just a minute. Uh, and, and those fishes have been lost from these other areas that are no, uh, are no longer uh, clear. And uh, so, again, uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about what I consider to be a freshwater arc in Canada. And, and I've, ta I've been talking about the Old Sable Channel, but I also um, want to include the vicinity because when you look at, uh, this is from Google Earth, when you look at the Sable River, here's the cut, and then it starts going down into you know, the mouth in, in Port Franks. Over here, you can see that, that really dark, clear water of the old Sable Channel. Well, guess what? We see some of that really clear water over here as well. And this is, and, and here, this is L Lake uh, that has this very clear water. And again, it, it has this clear water because it's, it's not joined to the Sable River anymore. And uh, so, that same high quality water and habitat that we see in the old Osable Channel, we also see in some of these other water bodies um, in the vicinity of uh, the Osable River mouth. And I, I, I don't want you to worry too much about the, the details on, on this uh, little figure here, but this is um, a figure that is, is found in a report on that old Osable channel.ca site. Uh, and the, the key take home message here is um, some of these, these are the sites in the Old Osable Channel and then, and then the Old Mouth Lake and L Lake. The sites on the left hand side of this graph are, are impaired sites. That is, uh, there is some impacts of humans on those areas. And the water quality, uh, higher up on the graph is poorer and it's it's better lower down. So up here, this is this is um, the old Sable Channel in the vicinity of South Cot Pines. Relative to the other areas of the old Sable Channel, the, the water quality is relatively poor. And then it gets better as you get moved towards the Pinery, and then you see the water quality uh, and wetland condition is actually very good in L Lake and Old Mouth Lake. And then uh, we can we can relate that to what's going on in the actual uh, water bodies. What we see in the more degraded sites are these uh, invasive the invasive uh, European uh, uh, water milfoil, and then in the uh, the 
sites with better water quality, we see the native um, Kara and, and, and the native uh, Najas in, in uh, uh, L Lake and Old Mouth Lake. And these two types of vegetation are what the species that we're studying really, really like. Uh, it, it's it's like filamentous vegetation with finger leaves like fingers as opposed to you know um, like um, as opposed to leaves like uh, say a, a cat's tail uh, which is more like the the, the milfoil and uh, so the milfoil is less desirable and we think it's because some of these small fishes that we'll be talking about uh, can hide out better in these uh, these plants, these native plants that have finger like uh, leaves. Uh, so we see, uh, to summarize, we see really good water quality in parts of the Old Estable Channel and L Lake and um, Old Mouth Lake. And in fact, this is some of the best water quality you'll find anywhere in southwestern Ontario. And again, it's because the Old Estable Channel is isolated, as is L Lake. Isolated from the watershed, the impacts of the watershed, isolated from invasive species, that makes this a unique environment. But it is not, it, it, it's not free of threats. And I want to introduce you to some of the, the really in, interesting uh, species that occur in uh, the Old Osawa Channel in the vicinity. Uh, including the Lake Chub Sucker here that gets to be about no more than about 10 inches long. Um, you know, the average adult would probably be six to eight inches, and it's currently considered endangered in Canada. And uh, we know that based on uh, Kosiwuk report. Kosiwuk is the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, and they're the body that assesses the how endangered species are. Uh, there's a recovery strategy for this, the species that outlines what we can do to minimize the threats and, 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 and prevent the species from actually becoming extirpated, uh, being lost entirely from uh, Canada. And um, there's also uh, an action plan for the Asabo River um, that, that, that talks about all of these, these species and, and how we can recover all of these species uh, taking an ecosystem approach. And this is where I want to talk a little more about the, the Lake Chub Sucker. Uh, this is its entire distribution in Canada. And if we look at this map, uh, note that the red little dots represent where it's been found recently. If you only see blue or, or these black triangles, that's where they're no longer found. So you can see that it's basically found in the Old Osable Channel in L Lake, a few wetlands in Lake St. Clair, uh, Point Pelee, uh, no longer found at Rondo, found in a few sites in Long Point Bay, but no longer in the watershed. And at one site in Lyons Creek in, uh, in, in the Niagara area. And at that, the only reason it exists at one site is because fresh water is pumped out of the Welland Canal into the headwater of this creek. Uh, which is one of the most polluted creeks in Canada. And if that water uh, was no longer pumped in there, the, the, the Lake Chub Sucker would be gone. So again, uh, the species prefers clear, still well-vegetated water with low turbidity, that is clear water. And the threats include siltation, increased turbidity, and a loss of habitat uh, due to eutrophication, invasive plants, and climate change. And I put those in red because those are emerging threats that, that we were not aware of even 10 years ago. And those are the threats that appear to be um, uh, impacting uh, Lake Chub Sucker in, in our area. Uh, the Pugno Shiner is another species that is, um, is found in the Old Osable Channel and Old Mouth Lake. It is the second smallest vertebrate in Canada um, after the least starter. So the species matures at about two to three inches long. And, and we do have a Kosiwuk report and a recovery strategy for it. And uh, again, 
this it has a little broader distribution than the Lake Shop Sucker because it's also found in eastern Ontario in the St. Lawrence River and the Bay of Quinty area. But again, you can see um, the red dots are the, the areas uh, where it's still found. And if you see any of these other symbols like you do at Point Pelee or, or Long Point, the, the species has been lost. So you see in, in in southwestern Ontario, it's found in even fewer locations than the Lake Chubsucker. And uh, like the Lake Chubsucker, it prefers clear still and uh, well vegetated water with low turbidity. And uh, again, I emphasize the low turbidity and, and the black text actually comes from this really good report on, on fish species at risk um, that's found on the Old Soul Channel uh, website. And, it, and, and like the lake chub sucker, the threats are loss of habitat uh, due to eutrophication, invasive plants, and climate change. And then additional, additionally sediment and nutrient loading. Now this, you, I'm sure you, you've heard of northern pike and muscalunge. Well, this is their, their little cousin. It only gets to be about 12 inches long. It's called a grass pickerel. People, people, when the people catch it, they often mistake it for a juvenile pike. And um, it uh, has, it is considered special concern uh, in Canada. Uh, it's found in a few more locations, all, all in Ontario, southern Ontario. And there is a management plan for it uh, that outlines what action should be taken to prevent it from becoming rarer. And if you look at the distribution. You can see it's it's not unlike uh, the other two species. Um, uh, here again, it's found in our area down in, in Lake St. Clair. Uh, you can see based on the symbols that it's still present in most of the areas where it's historically being found. Another hotspot for it is the Niagara area, which is just outside of the range of this map. Um, it, unlike the other species, it pr pr prefers slightly warmer wa water slow moving with lots of vegetation. Uh, the threats are low water levels, loss of aquatic vegetation, decreased water transparency and lowering of stream temperatures. Uh, and then also, you know, we think invasive species and climate change uh, because climate change is not just about increasing water temperatures, but as we'll find out from the students also about um, decreasing oxygen levels. Um, the climate change is, is a threat to this species as well. And then the fourth species that is is, is listed by is being assessed as um, at risk by Kosiwik that's in the area is this beautiful species, formerly known as the northern, uh, sorry, the long-ear sunfish because of the large uh, flap on its uh, operculum, now known as the northern sunfish. And uh, you can see that's found in a few more locations, except again, look at these symbols. It's been a loss from a lot of these historical sites. And it prefers shallow areas of warm water with little current. And you can see that that it's 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 well known from this area as well. Uh, threats include turbidity and siltation, the invasive round goby, uh, bait fishing where they may be caught as bycatch, uh, invasive plants and climate change. Now, I, I, I've gone over the threats for these four main, uh, very, in my mind, iconic species at risk in Canada. And I will point out that part of this, this my, my um, freshwater arc thesis is that, uh, I haven't shown it to you, but we've done the genetics uh, across the ranges, the Canadian ranges of these four species. And the Old Assemble Channel, contains unique populations, unique genes that are only found uh, in the Old Ensemble Channel and nowhere else in Canada. So these species um, are very distinct, even when compared to uh, other populations within Canada, the, these are among the most distinct. So, you know, at, at the uh, species richness level, 60 plus species in the Old, old Ensemble Channel, um, it, it is unique. It, uh, at the uh, species at risk level has some of the rarest fishes in Canada found in it. And it's a refuge for those species. It's a place where they, they can persist 
it's unique. And on top of it, there are unique genes uh, that are only found in the old, oldest salvage channel. I would argue that those elements uh, truly make uh, the oldest salvage channel Canada's freshwater arc. Now, I, I just briefly summarized the key threats. So I've taken the threats for all the different species, and here are the key threats. Siltation resulting in, in, in um, turbidity, increased muddiness, that uh, indirectly uh, um, uh, causes declines in aquatic vegetation. When water gets muddier, uh, sun, sun does not penetrate as deeply, and uh, less aquatic vegetation grows, particularly those native species that that have those leaf, those um, finger-like leaves that the, these species really like to hide in. And then there may be direct physiological and behavioral effects on uh, species from siltation. So siltation may irritate the, the, the gills to the point that they do not function as well for, for uh, exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, we've shown through experiments uh, in, in uh, the, the Chapman lab, and, and Dr. Warren Chapman is a, is a co-supervisor in this project, shown um, through experiments that, that uh, increased turbidity will cause the, some of these species to, to school less, and as a result, be more susceptible to things like predation. Um, nutrient runoff results in, in enhanced vegetation, which could be a good thing if it's that native vegetation. However, it's often also that invasive vegetation that we do not um, want to have. And, and what happens is when you get too much vegetation, it dies off uh, in the winter, uh, back the, and then it's decomposed by bacteria that, that um, use up oxygen and release carbon dioxide, and you end up with what we call anoxic conditions conditions where there is no oxygen for the fishes. And this is, we know that this has resulted in the past uh, um, uh, some, some fish die-offs. Uh, and uh, invasive species uh, such as common carp increased turbidity and Phragmites like this, this, these massive reeds that are taking over this entire area need only need to look at the, the northern end of L Lake to see an invasion front. Um, Phragmites can directly decrease the amount of aquatic vegetation by changing aquatic habitat into semi-aquatic habitat where fish cannot live, and indirectly by when it dies off, causing these anoxic conditions. And then ongoing now and it's, is, is climate change, and, and, and the, um, climate change uh, may increase water temperatures and, 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 and anoxia, uh, through a variety of mechan mechanisms, and also uh, could result in decreasing water levels um, as a result of things like evaporation and, and changing precipitation patterns. Now, I'm just going to briefly go over some solutions that have been identified in, in the Species at Risk report on the Old Osable Channel website and in that Osable River uh, uh, action plan. And I'm only going to identify the ones that are directly related to the research that we're doing, and then the students will follow, follow up and explain this in more detail. So uh, one of the ongoing recommendations is to improve the understanding of the interactions among species at risk, fishes, succession, macrophyte communities, water quality, anthropogenic, anthropogenic stressors, and climate change. Basically, uh, how do these different threats actually impact these endangered fishes? You know, how do changes in the aquatic vegetation affect those um, endangered fishes? We need to better understand the requirements of those fishes in order to better understand what happens when uh, those environmental requirements change. And, you know, climate change is, is really an emerging issue, uh, and we, we need to um, research and consider the effects of climate change on management decisions. So we may be making decisions now based on the current climate, but the climate's changing so quickly, uh, are, will those, those managements be sound based on what the environment will look like 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? And 
in terms of shorter term recommendations in this report, initiate a, a monitoring program in the Oxbow wetlands, Bell Lake and um, and Old Mouth Lake, com comparable to that in the Old Osado Channel, um, where for both aquatic uh, aquatic macrophytes, which are the aquatic plants and, and, and fish species at risk. And the nature of our work will allow us to identify the, the amount of effort and the type of gear that should be used to, to in an ongoing monitoring program. So that will definitely be part of our research. Um, in the action plan uh, for the Asabal River, it does identify a, a high priority uh, of uh, confirming and identifying threats and evaluating their relative importance and, um, and the implementation of remedial actions to minimize their impacts on, on fish species at risk in the Old Asabal Channel and the Oxbow uh, uh, Lakes. And also to confirm and identify the threats, evaluate the relative importance uh, to, to minimize the. Uh, that seems very similar. In fact, uh, oh, uh, this, the part there is uh, to organize a technical team to work with researchers to identify issues to address the, the fish habitat uh, issues. So, uh, for example, winter refugia, and, and Jennifer will be talking about that very question. So these are two high priorities that our research will be directly addressing. And uh, at this point, I would like to turn the presentation over to Jennifer and Jessica, who will be introducing themselves and 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 uh, telling us a little bit about their the research that they will be doing this year. So Jennifer, I'm going to stop presenting, uh, and then you can press on. At the top of your screen, you should be able. Oh, I may have gone too far. Um, Rosalind. Hi, Nick. I may have gone too far. OK, <laughs> I'm going to have to bring this PowerPoint back up. Yeah, sorry about that. So just bear with me for a moment. OK. We're just loading it here. It'll be up in a second. Sorry about that, everyone. I, I clicked stop presenting because I assumed that then that would allow uh, Jennifer to take control. Mm -hmm. All right. Can everybody see that presentation up here again? Yes. OK. I'm going to fast forward us a little bit. And then I will allow the next presenter to take control now. OK, we need to go to about slide 30. More like we're just what? lagging a little bit. I just wanted to add, Nick, it's amazing how lucky we are to be able to live and work in such a diverse and special ecosystem. Hearing about um, just how scientifically significant it is, as well as obviously how beautiful it is. It's amazing. I agree. And, and, and uh, you know, that was one of, one of our major um, uh, thoughts in actually moving here because it is such a, a unique area. OK, over to you, Jennifer. Please introduce yourself. All right, um, hang on for a couple slides back. Uh, OK, uh, here, there we go. Can everybody see my yes. smiling face? <laughs> yes. yes, that's perfect. Okay. Great, wonderful. Hello, um, I'm Jennifer Powell. Um, and I'm currently a PhD student at the Physical and Environmental Sciences Department at the University of Toronto Scarborough. Prior to that, I was a fisheries biologist at, for, at an environmental consulting company uh, that worked primarily in the Great Lakes region. 
Um, but I've returned to academia because I wanted to do more conservation focused work, uh, which is one of the reasons I'm really quite excited to be able to work on the endangered light chub sucker this summer. So. Oh, I changed slides. <laughs> if you click oh. on the slide, there you go. OK, got it. All right, so why do we want to study Lake Chubsucker? So as have previously been said, um, they're known at only a very few locations in southwestern Ontario. They've only ever been identified at 13 locations and haven't been found at those in a number of those locations for quite a while. Um, so it's a very, very rare fish. Um, it's also very difficult to study uh, because even at those locations, it's typically found in very low numbers, which makes it very difficult to get enough fish to sample to get some any real data. Um, they also like shallow and densely vegetated habitats, which isn't very effective for our standard sampling techniques, which also makes them difficult to sample. Um, and as a result of this, uh, its biology in Ontario is very poorly understood. So we where our knowledge is very limited on things like it's when it spawns, what kind of habitat it uses when it spawns, um, the habitat of the various life stages of the fish, like the young of the year. We only have information on a very few observations from them. And uh, the habitat of the juvenile fish is uh, basically an educated guess at this point. Um, so this lack of knowledge is a real problem when it comes to protecting the species. Because if we don't know what habitat they're using the most and which ones are most critical for their survival, we can't pr protect it effectively. Um, and so this brings me to why do we want to study this fish in uh, the Port Franks area? And that's reason. The reason for that is uh, L Lake and the OAC. So at present, L Lake is home to the healthiest known population of Lake Chugsucker, Lake Chugsucker in all of Canada. Um, this is extremely important uh, because it's so rare at all the other locations. Um, there's actually enough fish in Elk Lake uh, that we can hopefully able are be able to sample enough of them that we can actually get real solid data on them. And we know this because previous studies have actually collected significant numbers of fish. Um, so we are we're very hopeful that we'll be very successful this summer. Um, as well, the small size of the lake is a, is a real benefit uh, because this allows us to really break it down into really fine scale and really look at the habitat and find out what habitat they're using, which habitat they're not using, and really nail down uh, what they need and what they don't need. Okay. Um, uh, finally, uh, has been, as has been said, uh, the lake has been isolated from the rest of the watershed keeping it quite pristine. Um, it has really good water quality and it's been isolated from a lot of invasive species. Uh, there really aren't that many threats to it except for a Frag Money's front on the uh, east side, but it, it hasn't moved into the lake yet. So it, this is an excellent opportunity to study a very rare fish in a fairly pristine habitat. Um, and we have the extra benefit of having the OAC uh, right nearby, uh, which also has one of the largest populations of this fish in Canada. Um, it as well is mostly isolated from the rest, um, although it does have some issues with low oxygen levels and uh, invasive carp. Um, so this provides us an opportunity to really examine the differences that you can see between these fish uh, utilizing habitat in a, in a uh, almost pristine habitat versus one that has a couple threats so that we can hopefully get a sense of how they manage those kind of threats. Right. So uh, for our field work this year, we have three main goals um, and these goals cover both uh, the work that I will be talking about um, doing as well as what my colleague Jessica will be doing. So I will be focusing on the Lake Chubsucker in the L Lake, which is the, the yellow lake that you see on the screen, whereas uh, my colleague Jessica will be looking at Pugno Shiner in Old Mouth Lake, which is the lake seen in green. Okay. What we are intending to do is break down the lakes into a lot of different sampling sites so we can really understand how the habitat differs across the lakes. 
um, you can see on the image uh, just a rough example of how many sites we are hoping to be able to tackle this summer. We shall see. Um, and uh, once we identify our sites, we'll be sampling them in order to understand the habitats um, in each lake that each of the life stages of all the fish are using. So that's the adults, as well as the juveniles, as well as the young of the year, uh, as well as the habitats they use in different seasons and for things like spawning or overwintering. Uh, and finally, we'll also be conducting studies to see how the fish are able to adapt to a warmer climate. So I'll be covering uh, the first two points. Oh, there we go. Uh, do we get, oh, no, all right. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, so I'll be covering the first two points, uh, whereas Jessica will be covering the third point and, and a part of point number one. Okay. All right. Um, so the first thing we're going to be covering is the fish community. So we'll be doing this by sampling fish at each of the sampling sites once per season, so spring, summer, and fall, uh, to see what the distribution of both the lake chub sucker and the pugno shiner are across our sample lakes, um, as well as what habitats they use uh, at different times of the year to see if they change or if they stay the same. Uh, we'll also be collecting data on other fish species that we find in the lake so we can better understand which species, fish species they like to be around and which ones they don't. Uh, we'll be primarily using two kinds of nets, although we'll be trying out a variety of different sampling techniques. Uh, but we'll primarily be using seine nets and fike nets. So seine nets are typically used in shallower waters near the shore where you can wade, uh, and then fike nets you can use in uh, deeper water areas. Uh, both of these types of nets are fairly low impact for the fish, which is important when you're studying threatened and sensitive species. And so uh, with the seine net, the, seine, uh, the net is dragged out into an arc, and then the fish are collected in the loose part of the net uh, and then we can collect them, ID them, measure them and then put them back in the water as quickly as we can. Um, for the fike nets, they're set up a little bit differently. They have wings uh, that you can see in the picture there that allow the, the fish to be funneled into the main part of the net, which uh, then hold, traps them into a mesh cage where they can swim around freely but they can't escape from. These nets are set overnight, so we'll set them up and then come back the next day, open the net, again, process the fish, and then put them right back into the lake. Um, so these ones can be used in deeper water, and you can see one of the, the barrier nets uh, in the lower picture there. All right, so the second part of the this work we'll be doing, we'll be looking at the habitat the fish are using. To do this, we'll be looking at a number of different components, um, including uh, one of the most important of which is the vegetation, uh, which we do this by using uh, quadrats, which are basically just a big square. We put them in the water and uh, try to figure out all these different species that are in that square. Uh, uh, so we'll also be looking at things like the substrate, which is the kind of bottom that is present. So is it silty, sandy, full of boulders, that kind of stuff. Uh, and hopefully next year, once we have an idea of where the fish are located, we can do some studies on food availability and see what kind of plants are available at those locations for them to eat, as well as things like benthic invertebrates, which are the pictures below. Uh, this is done by collecting mud samples, uh, sipping them through a bucket, and then counting all the little invertebrates and uh, insect larvae that are hang out in the bottom that the fish like to eat. Okay. Uh, and finally, uh, we'll also be looking at the water quality and seeing how that changes throughout the lake and across the seasons. We'll be measuring things like temperature, dissolved oxygen, turbidity, nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen, as well as potential pollutants that we might find. So like road salt, fertilizers, that kind of thing. Um, so we do this by you both using a water quality probe that you can just stick in the water and measure, take measurements, as well as uh, the lower picture there shows some loggers which are put into the, to the lake and take collect data for many, many months. So if anybody ever comes across one of these, uh, please leave them in place because they're busy collecting data for us. All right. All right, 
Right. Uh, and the last component I'll be talking about is uh, special habitat usage. So in particular, we'll be using, we'll be trying to identify which uh, habitats the lake chub sucker use for their winter refugia, as well as for spawning habitat. And we'll be doing this by using radio tra tagging and tracking. Okay, uh, so the radio tags are small devices. You can see a picture in the lower right hand corner. Uh, those are a variety of different sizes. They consist of a small unit encased in epoxy um, and, uh, and an antenna. So they are surgically implanted into the fish and with the antenna coming out of a small incision uh, so that it drags behind them in the water. Um, the fish are anesthetized before the surgery is taken place. So you can see there's a little tube of water there pushing water over the, the fish's gill so it doesn't suffocate while we're doing the surgery. Um, uh, the tag is inserted, the fish is sewn up, and then we put them into a recovery bin and wait till they fully recover before we release them back into the water. Uh, once they're in the water, the tag will give off a signal that we can then track with the antenna that you can see on the left there. Um, so hopefully uh, this will allow us to track these fish and follow them back to where, they, where they're hanging out during the winter and then in the spring follow them to their spawning habitat. Um, and now I will turn things over to Jessica. Hello. So I just click take control and yes. Oh, OK. All right. OK, is that that worked? OK. Sorry, <laughs> I'm, I'm new to Microsoft Teams. Um, hi. Um, I'm Jessica and I'll be talking, uh, as Jen said, about Pugno Shiner uh, in Old Mouth Lake, um, but just a bit about me. Um, Jessica Remeyer. Um, I've been working with uh, fish, sort of uh, doing research on fish uh, since my bachelor's. Um, I have a bit of experience um, mostly working with fish uh, in the lab. So I have a master's um, where I looked at the effects of environmental stressors on uh, ph physiology of gulf killifish. Um, but currently, I'm a PhD student in Lauren Chapman's lab um, at McGill University. I started in January of 2020, um, and I'm my sort of overall focus of my PhD is to look at the effects of multiple environmental stressors on uh, endangered Canadian fishes. So my research is focused mostly on Pugno Shiner, as well as um, another fish, uh, Red Side Dace, uh, that we we haven't mentioned, but is another uh, fish that. Uh, uh, another fish that um, is uh, not doing well in Canada. Um, oh, oh. oh, good. The video, are the videos working? They are. Oh, great. OK, so um, just briefly um, on some of the research I'm doing with Red Side Dace that's um, not related to what we're uh, doing this summer, but they're just such gorgeous fish. I wanted to include a video of them and just touch on um, the research that um, I've been doing with them. Uh, these are some of the fish uh, in the lab, um, and I'm looking at the effects of low dissolved oxygen, so anoxia, um, and how that can affect uh, heat tolerance in these fish um, with the goal of seeing if um, sort of exposure to these low oxygen conditions could actually have cross tolerance and affect their ability to deal with warming temperatures. Um, but really, the focus of um, my PhD is the Pugno Shiner, uh, these wonderful fish. So these are uh, some of the fish that we have in our lab currently. Um, and as Nick said, uh, these are really tiny minnows uh, that uh, are threatened in Canada. Um, this individual here on the top is about four centimeters. Um, and they're really threatened because of loss of habitat due to a variety of um, environmental stressors. Um, and my focus of my research is wanting to understand the effects of things like climate change um, and turbidity on these fish. Um, so I actually have um, some fish in the lab that I've been doing um, experiments on looking at the effects of turbidity and climate change. Oh. Um, so we've been looking at the, the interactive effects of, um, uh, sorry, turbidity and temperature. So I have fish that I've been exposing in the lab to high and low turbidity. 
So about seven NTU and zero NTU and um, high and low temperatures, so 25 degrees and 16 degrees. Um, and we wanna know if um, exposure to higher temperatures, so in uh, could be having an effect on, sorry, if the effect of turbidity could be interacting with the effect of temperature. So are our fish more vulnerable to turbidity when temperatures are warmer or vice versa? Um, and this is just how we do this in the lab. Um, I wanted, I love including videos. Um, this is one of our tanks. We use um, bentonite clay and we put that in the water. And this is just uh, one of our tanks with the fish swimming in the background. Um, but on to uh, what you're all here for and what we're so excited about for this summer. Um, I'll be looking at the Pugno Shiner that are in Old Mouth Lake. Um, and as Jen said, uh, the goals of our research are to assess habitat requirements, um, but we also want to quantify the population sizes that exist in these um, watersheds or in these lakes, as well as um, assessing their thermal tolerance. So for assessing the uh, population size, uh, we're going to be sampling across many sites, as Jen said. Um, and we're going to be catching fish at those sites multiple times. So our plan is to uh, tag these fish as we catch them um, and tag them with visual implant elastomer. Um, and I have the photos here just show sort of how that's done. You would inject the skin of the fish with a liquid um, plastic sort of material that hardens once it's in the fish's skin and it's a permanent marker. So when we go out and we catch these fish, we can um, tag them the first time we catch them. And if we re-catch them, that can sort of help um, get more accurate models of how many fish are in the lake. Because unfortunately, we can't, we can't, um, we can't, sorry, catch all of the fish, right? We can't go out and we wouldn't even, there's no way to know that we could catch all of the fish. Um, and I see someone ask, why not pit tags? For Pugno Shiner, these fish are so tiny that we can't fit a pit tag into them. You can't put it into their abdomen and you can't, there's nowhere for the tag to go. Uh, so VIE is a nice alternative to this. Um, and then moving on to the thermal tolerance data. Um, we know that a major threat to these fish is uh, climate change, right? Climate warming. Uh, not only are temperatures increasing on average, there's also um, a higher incidence of things like heat waves. So where the waters get really, really hot for long periods of time. Um, and so it's really inter important to understand uh, how tolerant these fish are to warming temperatures. Um, and a standardized way of doing that, that we do that in the lab is um, called a uh, critical thermal maximum. Um, and it's widely used in lab and in the field. Um, and these photos here, or these videos, I mean, um, are of Pugno Shiner on the top and Red Side Dace on the bottom, experiencing one of these experiments where we um, we put them into sort of a confined space um, and we increase the temperature in the water at a linear rate. And then we find the temperature where the fish um, essentially faint or they, they lose equilibrium and they can't function anymore. And really beyond that temperature, the fish would not survive if they couldn't uh, be brought into cold, cooler temperatures. So um, what's really great about the work we're doing this summer is we're hoping to get uh, this type of data on fish right out of the lakes so we can get really good estimates of the fish in the field, what, what is their thermal tolerance and what types of temperatures are, what is the maximum temperature that they can um, experience uh, there. And we're also hoping um, to compare Pugno Shiner with a non-endangered Black Chin Shiner to see if um, perhaps Pugno Shiner are doing poorly because of their lack of uh, thermal tolerance. Um, and also because we have all of this habitat data, we can see if the fish are, are um, really close or if they're tolerant to temperatures that are really close to the environmental temperature or if they're um, sort of buffered, if they're tolerant uh, to lower temperatures. Um, and I think that's the slides for the stuff that I was going to talk about. Um, I don't know if you want to step in to uh, talk yeah. about our Yep, I can, yeah. I can do that, Jessica. We've created oh, a Facebook uh, page. Sorry, I'll mute myself. Uh, I, I just wanted to finish up uh, by saying that uh, 
you know, we're, we are looking for citizen scientists to help us. And I think, you know, we do have a challenge in this, this COVID world for a little while longer um, in terms of helping out directly in the field, but we, we are looking for help in terms of faci facilitating access, um, storing our boats during the week. Uh, it'll either be a canoe or a small John boat uh, just overnight, so well, we don't have to pack it up and drive it away and, and drive it back every day. Um, I think it would be really good to document ice cover and um, and uh, also to um, uh, I think as as COVID restrictions ease, we can we'll, there will be other opportunities to participate. Uh, you can follow uh, Jess and Jen's Endangered Fish Adventure on Facebook, and you can also uh, contact us through that that Facebook page. Um, uh, if uh, you would like to uh, be a citizen scientist and, and help us with uh, these projects. And the one last, if you could just uh, forward it one more time, Jessica, I'm not sure. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, I'd just like to point out some of the uh, resources that are available online. You can you can find the the COSIMIC reports and the recovery strategies at the Sara Registry. Uh, Sauble Bayfield Conservation Authority has a lot of great information, as is Friends of the Old Sauble Channel. And um, uh, of course, we would like to um, just recognize their funders. Uh, uh, the DFO uh, Nature Fund and CERC Discovery Grants to me and, and Dr. Chapman. And I, I will point out that Jennifer is part of a, um, a program called FishCast. And FishCast is a program led out of University of Windsor, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a co-PI on it. And it's meant to train the next generation of fisheries professionals. And it has a great emphasis on uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusiveness. And and I would um, encourage you to check out our, our website um, if you'd like to find more about how we're training the next generation of, of fisheries professionals. And I think that is it. Uh, I think we're happy to take um, questions at this point. Hi, yes, great, thanks so much. Um, we'll be taking questions in just a moment, but I just wanted to summarize by saying um, the Bowman Mashort, the Bowman report that Nick referred to a few times during the presentation was based on work and research that the ABCA conducted. And the report is a summary of the science and recommendations, which is available on oldosabelchannel.ca. You can also connect with us on Facebook at Friends of the Old Osabel Channel or contact me by email at rchang at abca.ca to be notified of future webinars and opportunities. Uh, in the next few weeks, we have upcoming webinars um, on turtle nest cage building, which will be hosted by Hope Brock and Carrie Jean. We also have one on the Carolinian Forest and Pinery Provincial Park, hosted by Alistair McNamara from Pinery Provincial Park. And we'll have one on Family Fishing Week about how to get into fishing uh, and how to kind of identify fish. So those are some webinars that um, you might be interested in as well. Um, Nick said that we need your help. We can't do it alone, which is very true. Um, we need citizen scientists to help us with our research. Uh, and we need people like you that take time out of your day to care and to learn more about the environment and the ecosystem that we live in. Um, just another note, if you do see myself or uh, one of my coworkers out with the dissolved oxygen loggers. I believe Jennifer mentioned that earlier. Uh, you might see us out and about on Thursday or Friday this week in the Old Osabel Channel in Port Franks um, installing the DO loggers. And um, last but not least, I'd like to ask you to show us how you're changing your lawn from manicured to magnificent, especially if you live along the Old Osabel Channel. Um, we would love to see what you're doing. We would love to see um, how you're managing your yards. And um, for those of you that do enter on Facebook or by email, we will be giving away a copy of our native plant field guide, uh, which is like this. And it's 
native plants from Grand Bend to Port Franks Corridor, created by Ian Jean and Carrie Jean, and they are available for $5 um, if you're interested in purchasing one. So all of the information um, from this webinar, all of the contact information, including the JJ Fish Adventure and the websites that Nick listed will be emailed out to you afterwards. I do have your email addresses and we'll send that out. Um, so you don't have to worry about collecting that information now. And with that, I will leave it open to questions. I think all of the questions from our chat were answered during the um, presentation. So if anybody has any questions now, feel free to either ask them in the chat box or you can raise your hand with the little face and hand raise emoji that you might see on the top or bottom of your screen. Uh, and or you can unmute yourself and ask your question now. Any questions? Well, you know, I, I would say uh, that um, people that we're happy to answer follow up questions uh, on, on through the, the Facebook site. And if um, if you uh, see us out there, uh, we would love to um, fill you in on what what we're doing. Um, we of course, we still want to maintain social distancing until we no longer have to do that. And uh, we will plan to make sure that we have um, a community day where community members are are, are uh, welcome to drop by and we can explain what we're doing in more detail uh, when it's safe to do so. Rosalind, uh, Dawn has a question that perhaps is best uh, yes. answered by you. Um, fishing is permitted during fishing season in the Old Osable Channel. Uh, however, we always ask that you practice catch and release and fish responsibly. And please be careful if you are uh, that you're not using any bait fish, as many bait fish um, end up getting released and become invasive. Uh, that people might have a hard time identifying them before they use them, and then once they're in the channel, it's a little bit too late. I will point out that the probability that you'll catch a pug nose shiner is virtually nil. <laughs> the probability that you'll catch a lake chup sucker is probably quite low. Um, if you're using worms or small jigs, you may catch a northern sunfish or a grass pickerel. Uh, it would be nice to, um, you know, if you handle them gently and place them back. And if you're interested in, in catching fish to keep, please make sure you know the difference between the different sunfishes because there's uh, at least three species. Well, I think there's three species of sunfishes in the Old Osable Channel, bluegill, pumpkin seed, and northern sunfish. So please know your, your fish identifications. And, and, um, and any, any pike that's less than 12 inches long, uh, just assume that it's a grass pickerel. And, and please release it. Yes, and um, if you are, I see, Don, that you said you're not so much interested in fishing, more so conservation. Uh, if you know anybody um, that's interested in fishing, then perhaps our Family Fishing Week uh, webinar at the beginning of July or end of June would be something that those people are interested in, and you could forward them my email address so we could send that off to them. Rosalind, I do see it's a, a hand up, but I can't find out who it belongs uh, to. Let me take a look here. I see we've got quite a bit of activity going on in our chat now, which is great. Um, if your hand is up, Dawn, yeah, I see that your hand is up again. So maybe that's from before. I'm just going to lower that. Uh, and that's it for our raised hands. And while this presentation was focused on 
of course, research going on in the oldest level channel um, and the surrounding areas, Port Frank, Port Frank, et cetera. We do, as a conservation authority, um, need citizen scientists all across the watershed. So I saw some of you are living up in Goderich. Um, there are still areas in the northern part of our watershed that are much closer to you that we're still looking for citizen scientists for other projects, and we'd love to have volunteers. Any more questions or comments? I saw a lot of thank yous, um, Nick, Jessica, and Jennifer. Uh, a lot of people were very, very pleased with this presentation and your wealth of knowledge. Um, so thank you so much for that. I really appreciate you taking your time uh, to present this and to encourage people in our community and in our watershed to start being stewards for the land and water. Well, thank you, Rosalind, for inviting us and thank you everyone for spending the last hour with us, let, letting, letting us uh, try to convince you that uh, we really do live in a special place. We do, and I'm sure you won't have any trouble finding people to help you. Um, so welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> Thank you. And 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 Jennifer and, and Jessica will be neighbors for the entire summer as well. So they're looking mm -hmm. forward to coming down. <laughs> well, I've only been out here a year now. I moved out um, from the GTA last March, and I absolutely love it. It's just gorgeous out here on Lake Huron, especially along the channel. Uh, it's, it's very unique and magnificent, and I'm so happy that I get to work there. Uh, Nick, we do seem to have a few questions about fish in the chat. Okay. Um, would any of these fish be in the adjoining pond? Depends on what pond you mean. Uh, if it's a very clear pond, like the water of the Old Osable Channel, yes, possibly. If it's a very turbid pond, uh, very unlikely. Oh, and then Carrie, Carrie, Carrie knows even better than uh, that I do the, the details. So, um, so that, that's good to know, and it would be interesting to determine if that in fact is the case. Hi, Carrie. Did you want to add something to that? I see you've just unmuted yourself. I just uh, wanted to add that um, I know Bill Redhead and I know the pond he's talking about and, and uh, it is quite close to the oldest level channel shore in Heron Woods and there could be some mixing of fish, I would say, um, in that pond and, and the OAC and it is quite clear, Nick, and we have seen black line shiners swimming around in there. so. We've done some staining. I we have not actually detected any of the SAR, but um, I think we, it would be worth a look again, perhaps. Maybe yeah. for the sunfish. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of sunfish in the well, pond. You know that. At, yeah. Yeah, at Huron Woods Clubhouse. Um, and Bill, thank you for joining us tonight. Bill is uh, he was featured in one of the pictures at the beginning of the presentation. Um, he learned how to spade Phragmites to remove it from their pond so that it wouldn't continue spreading further into the channel. So thank you, Bill. Uh, I'll point out that uh, when we were looking to move here, we were hoping to get one of the houses that had was adjacent to the ponds, uh, and unfortunately none were available. But uh, I, I paddled by there and looked in with interest, and, and now that I know where those ponds are, yes, I, I look at them with great interest. Um, they look uh, quite suitable, and I'm I'm almost certain that when we we paddled uh, down by the Huron um, Huron Woods Community Center last year, that I saw small schools of uh, pugno shiner, very shallow, and it was I think it was just a week or two after I was out in the field with Jessica uh, sampling those the, for those shiners that she used in her experiments, and we got those from Eastern Ontario. But I had my my shiner uh, my shiner vision on, and it really yeah exactly, and it the, the behavior, uh, the small size of them, um, and the, the the habitat there really suggested uh, pugno shiner. Okay, uh, last chance for any questions or comments. If anybody would like to 
unmute themselves and ask, raise their hand or comment in the chat box. We'll give you another minute and then I think we will end this for the evening. I see Anne is saying great presentation. Thank you. She learned a lot. So thank you for participating, Anne. OK, we'll have to do it this again next year so we can tell you what we've, we've uh, learned. OK, and yeah, we look forward to doing that. Yes, and I'm wondering now, is there a way for people this year to find out more about the research that you've conducted? Will that be posted on your J&J &J Fish Adventure Facebook page? Um, is there a way for people in the community to stay uh, in the loop? I think that's the best way. And that, that, that was the thought behind the, having that page. So um, it, it, to make it most accessible. Excellent. And I'll be sending out links to that by email. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, especially Nick, Jennifer, and Jessica for your time. We look forward to continuing to work with you in the future and to hear more about your research. Um, and thank you to all of the members of the community for your stewardship and dedication to promoting our land, water, and resources. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks, you guys.